QSO Today, Episode 342, John Ackerman, N8UR. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers and accessories for the radio amateur. Reminding you in this new year to check out their new IC705 all-band portable transceiver now shipping from your favorite amateur radio dealer. My thanks to ICOM America for their continued support of the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, your host. We are just two weeks away from the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, opening on Friday, March 12th at 6 p.m. Pacific Time. We have an amazing array of speakers and exhibitors on our new platform to inspire you to all things amateur radio. If you do not have your ticket yet, please go to the QSO Today HamExpo.com website or by clicking on one of the banners on the QSO Today homepage. We are making every attempt to make this a memorable and valuable event. Flex Radio is our platinum sponsor, and now Mauser Electronics has joined Elecraft, R Finder, Connect Systems, and Quicksilver Radio as gold sponsors. John Ackerman, N8UR, was my guest almost 200 episodes ago and is a speaker in the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. John spends much of his time as a proponent of open source, freely sharing his software and hardware designs with his Tapper community. Join us as we discuss Tapper, SDR transceivers, and the issues around open source and the maker movement. N8UR, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, John? Hi, Eric. Uh, This is John, and 8 are here. John, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, um, I was always a geek uh, from probably elementary school on, and I was interested in ham radio. I I remember when I was probably eight or nine years old, uh, but never had the willpower to learn the code, uh, which seemed like uh, a common challenge for many of us. Um, And so nothing really happened at that point with the hobby. But when I was maybe, I don't know, 13 or 14, the big CB craze came along And one of my uh, friends, actually my best childhood friend, uh, Tom Erickson, and I got into that, and we built our own stations with, uh, I had an ancient Holocrafters tube CB that had, I think, five channels in it or something. And then we started putting up antennas for other people and played with that for a couple of years. But as the popularity grew, um, it became clear that that wasn't really the place to hang out. So... um, Tom and I kind of both decided we wanted to get our ham tickets, and uh, we were we were in a very small area, a town of about 500 people in northeastern Wisconsin, and uh, my dad knew uh, one of the local hams, uh, a guy named uh, Jeff Vore, uh, W9QBJ, who's now a silent key, and he got Tom and I hooked up with Jeff, and uh, Jeff was a, a great mentor and teacher in Elmer. And uh, we got our uh, our novice tickets. Uh, mine arrived, I think, right around my 16th birthday in 1974. And uh, one of the things that, that I remember was, uh, again, rural uh, community in northern Wisconsin. Um, I rode my snowmobile to Jeff's uh, house to uh, uh, take uh, lessons uh, it was before I had my driver's license. So <laughs> the snowmobile was the only way I could get there without uh, my parents having to drive me. Uh, and so, uh, what was your that first was, call? Really, my original call was uh, WN9OWI, and uh, not not a particularly great one, but uh, it uh, it did. Uh, so I got my ticket in '74, and uh, first rig was uh, a Heathkit HW16 that I built. And my memory is a little fuzzy; I haven't gone back to check the the history but i think right around that time is when uh the fcc changed the rules a little bit and you could uh novices could use uh vfos not just crystal control so i started out for the first month or two i had my license with i think i had three crystals uh then i built the vfo that went with the hw16 and used that uh, for a while and um around that time my father 
uh, who's also named John, became interested. Uh, he, he was a great one for uh, going all into to a, a hobby. And he had been interested in ham radio back when he was a kid, uh, but he was a child of the Depression. And uh, the money just wasn't there for him to do anything, so he never got his ticket then. But he, he ended up getting his license, um, and, he, and of course, he had some money, uh, whereas I, the, uh, the teenager, didn't. So he bought, uh, I think it was uh, Kenwood TS520 that we used um, for a while. And uh, of course, that was a much nicer, easier to, to operate rig and could do a whole lot more. Um, I ended up trading in my novice for a technician and got uh, Whiskey Baker 9, uh, OWI, uh, because, again, I, I had learned the five words a minute of code, but it didn't come naturally to me, and I was getting ready to go off to college. And uh, at that time, if, if you had a novice ticket once, you could not let it lapse uh, or, or renew it. So I got the tech to you know, keep uh, active. And then um, I guess uh, at about my junior year of college, I buckled down, spent the summer listening to uh, code practice tapes, uh, and uh, got my advanced. And this was when you still had to drive to Chicago uh, to take the test. Uh, you, uh, it was before the volunteer examiners. So I got my, uh, my advanced ticket um, and got much more active. And then uh, I went to law school following college. And I don't know why we decided this was a good idea, but a group of us uh, thought that we would uh, get our uh, extra tickets. So I spent uh, my first year of law school, in addition to cramming for class, uh, listening to Morse code tapes. And uh, I was in Michigan at that point, so I drove to Detroit and uh, took the extra uh, exam and managed to pass that. And uh, then the next year, we got even more crazy and decided to get commercial tickets so a bit more cramming, and uh, I went, went uh, over to the Detroit office and got the entire suite of uh, commercial tickets from third, second, first, and um, radar endorsement in one sitting. And with the, we were going to the next year do the telegraph, but that one, uh, no one had, had the time to study, and uh, I, I never did get my telegraph ticket. I really wish that I had. So, okay, <laughs> so you have all these licenses. Um uh, did that help at all to help pay for um, college and law school? Did you become a, really. <laughs> a, a commercial broadcaster, uh, you know, in the middle of the night while you're studying? No, I, ne I never did that. Uh, uh, the main reason I got the radar endorsement was I figured I could be my own expert witness if I ever got caught uh, for speeding uh, by radar, and uh, I could, could challenge it. I never had to do that either. But no, it was just uh, more of a challenge getting things done. And in my early days, actually, ham radio was, was always important, but my other passion was photography. And I had actually intended to be a professional photographer but when I was in college, I was diagnosed with an eye condition that uh, would have made that a challenging career. So very cleverly, I then switched over to something where I had to read all the time uh, and went to law school. Well, you you, um, you jumped to law school, but um, did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? Did you, what did you do as an undergraduate? Um, as an undergraduate, my degree was in journalism, and I – Use the photography. Uh, I was extremely active in uh, the campus newspaper and yearbook, uh, and that that was was really where I spent most of my time. But I did um, manage to uh, get active on the year. Uh, there, I went to the University of Dayton here in, in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and uh, when I started, we did not have an active ham club. There had been one in the past, but it. He had uh, faded away, but one of the brothers, it, it was a Catholic university, had a station up in the attic space of the tallest building on campus, and I got uh, permission from him to go up there every now and then so I could talk back uh, to W9QBJ, my Elmer, and did that. And then uh, there were several other hams uh, at the university at that time, and a group of us got together and decided that we would uh, re-energize the uh, radio club and we got a small grant to buy some equipment and uh, some space to set up the station so we did have a have a club station and i was active in that 
And also in law school, I was very active at WAUM, uh, the University of Michigan Club Station, uh, which had a, a history that it goes back to, I, I think, 1912 or 1913 uh, was the beginning of, of that uh, club and that call sign and uh, uh, had a, a lot of history and a lot of uh, interesting activities. So I spent uh, time that I should have been studying uh, was spent uh, at the radio club uh, chasing DX and working contests. What's your favorite operating activity? Um, probably contesting, and these days more on VHF. Um, I've gotten involved with a, a active group of uh, VHFers here in the Ohio area, and, and when I lived in Georgia previously, um, I operated with one of the multi-app groups there. Um, and it's VHF contesting is very different than HF, and uh, I, I like the HF style of being able to you know get on and do a run of 100 QSOs an hour, uh, and you don't very often do that on on VHF. Uh, but uh, I've also always been fascinated by the station building and the equipment and and uh, the design of of the operating f- uh, facility. And VHF uh, is fantastic in that regard because there's always something new that you can do uh, for, with the hardware, with the antennas, uh, whatever. Uh, so it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. What's your current rig? Uh, currently, uh, I'm I'm not all that active from home, but I have uh, as my primary station uh, one of the uh, high performance software defined radio or HPSDR systems. Uh, the Tapper, uh, an organization that I have been very heavily involved with for many years, uh, did as a project. And the, the unit that I'm using is called a Hermes, and it's the single board, uh, complete transceiver with a little uh, amplifier board that gives it about 10 watts output. And uh, that that hardware is no longer available from uh, Tapper directly, but it was an open hardware design. Uh, and as, as a result, other people have, have been able to manufacture it. And uh, there's a company in India called Apache Labs that makes the current version of that same equipment. They've added some bells and whistles uh, to the original uh, Tapper uh, d- design, but uh, they have the base, it's basically the same thing. And, and the control software is interchangeable uh, with the radios. So the design has lived on and, uh, it's still available, but I've got one of the original tapper boards. And again, it's 10 watts, uh, 160 through 6 meters, and I have a 10-tech 100-watt solid-state amp that I use uh, uh, for HF. And uh, for 6 meters, I have a 300-watt amp uh, that the uh, HPSDR will drive very nicely. And uh, when and I you have get transverters on, for VHF and UHF? I, I'm planning to build those. Uh, that's one of my semi-retirement projects mm-hmm. uh, is to, to – I want to put everything into – I think it's going to be two rack chassis boxes that will provide the entire HF through uh, probably 1296 uh, capability. All being run by the uh, Hermes. Yeah. Very cool. John, you're an intellectual property lawyer at NCR in Atlanta, and we recently discussed uh, before the show that you've just moved um, back to Dayton and are working half-time. But you're a, a property law- intellectual property lawyer by profession and one of the pioneers of the open source movement, especially open hardware. Why is open hardware important to amateur radio? That's a great question, and I, I want to clarify one thing a little bit. Um, when people are described as an intellectual property lawyer, that implies uh, uh, the ability to do patents and things like that, which I, I actually don't have. I'm, I'm not a, a licensed or experienced patent lawyer. But what I have done for 25-plus years is um, software licensing and the, the copyright and and trade secret and all the other issues that are, that are related uh, to uh, software primarily, and that's that's really more, more my uh, uh, focus. But to your question about why open hardware is important uh, to ham radio, uh, there's a very simple answer. It's what we've always done. Uh, in the old days, when people built their own radios because they had to, 
how did they come up with the circuits? They may have designed them themselves, but very likely they went to QST and found uh, the article, for example, for the HBR-16 receiver that was published back in the 50s. And they would build uh, their radio from the information and the schematics uh, that were published in that article. Well, that was open source hardware. And what we're trying to do is preserve the ability uh, for not just hams, but makers and tinkerers of all sorts uh, to be able to continue building in, uh, their own equipment uh, from shared designs. And open source software is a m much better known, but it's the idea of philosophically that you are creating a community and the community shares uh, what has been developed, but they contribute back. So open source software is licenses are designed that you can get and use the software, but they also, to greater or lesser degrees, encourage you to make changes and contribute those changes back for the benefit of the, of the whole community. And that open source software model has been around you know, really since the 90s, actually, probably earlier than that. I'm not sure when Richard Stallman uh, first got started, but it was probably in the late 70s even. Uh, open hardware is a similar concept. And it actually was developed by uh, by Tapper, although other organizations have done open hardware licenses and, and projects, so I don't want to imply that Tapper was the only uh, one or even the first one. But when we started the HPSDR project, uh, we had a number of extremely talented volunteers uh, who were professionals, uh, RF engineers and professional circuit board designers and you know, all these great skills, and they wanted to work together to develop this product uh, or this project, and they wanted to make sure that their work would continue to be available and, and the designs could be shared and improved. And that project asked me to develop a, an open hardware license to support their activity, and that's the work that I then did uh, with a lot of input from uh, contributors across the community uh, to uh, develop the Tapper Open Hardware License, which is, uh, again, it's not the only one. It's one of several, but it's, I think, the first kind of fully published, um, widely uh, usable uh, licenses for open hardware. And we did that, uh, I think, in about 2005. And uh, I keep threatening to do an update, which... Uh, will come along as soon as I get unpacked and, and have time to, uh, to get settled down here in the, in the new house. Is there a sense that um, without using open hardware licenses that home brewers or, you know, who um, publish their, um, their designs online could possibly be impinging on commercial hardware patents? Is well, that, that risk is there no matter what. Um, but what the open hardware license does is it makes it harder for someone to take your design that you've published under the OHL and take it private. So uh, the way the license works, a large company that wanted to steal the design and, and make it proprietary would have to seriously think about the risks that they run in doing that. And so it's, it's really intended to encourage the sharing, the, this community aspect, which to me is first of all what ham radio has been about for a hundred and well, however many years. Um, and it's also what the maker community is about. Um, and it's, it simply is a tool to help preserve that uh, ethos of, uh, of a community that shares its knowledge. And now this message from ICOM America. Love is in the air at ICOM. This sweetheart of a package includes the ICOM IC705, the perfect sidekick for hams that like to enjoy what is both great outdoors and indoors. The ICOM IC705 is the perfect companion with its base station features and functionality at the tip of your fingertips in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at just over 2 pounds with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. This fine rig supports QRP and QRPP operations. 
features include a 4.3-inch color touchscreen with a live band scope and waterfall display, 5-watt transmitter power with a BP272, and 10 watts out with a 13.8 DC supply, single sideband CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions, micro USB connector, Bluetooth, and wireless LAN, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, micro SD card slot, and the HM243 speaker microphone is standard equipment. Of course, the perfect accessory for the IC705 is the now available optional backpack, the LC192, with a special compartment for your ICOM IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or a day social distancing in the park. Let us not forget that the IC705 will replace the other company's radio as the first choice of microwave operators who need the very best baseband rig. Finally, there is a whole list of accessories and software for the IC705. For more information, go to ICOM's website by clicking on the banner ad in this episode's show notes page. The ICOM IC705 is in stock at your favorite ham radio dealer. And when you make that purchase, be sure to tell your salesman that you heard about the IC705 here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO Today. You're the past president of Tapper, and you mentioned Tapper um, just recently. Um, what is Tapper? Uh, could you go into a little bit more detail? And um, sure. in addition to the Hermes, what, what else do they produce for ham radio? Okay, well, Tapper originally started in the 1970s, the, the initial... Uh, stand for Tucson Amateur Packet Radio, although uh, we're no longer based in Tucson and we no longer focus on packet radio. So we keep the name, but we use just the initials, kind of like IBM or NCR uh, that uh, uh, use the brand recognition but don't uh, go into what uh, is behind the initials uh, too much because it's no longer that relevant. So Tapper started uh, with a, a group of folks who were playing with the packet radio uh, technology right after the FCC first legalized it. And uh, there are a, a number of people, and, and uh, I, I know I'm missing names, but Lyle Johnson uh, was one of the key early members uh, who was based in Tucson. And they developed the first uh, TNC, uh, Terminal Node Controller, that was designed uh, to use the new AX25 specification that had just been hammered out uh, in part at a Tapper con- or a conference that Tapper was involved with. Uh, and so initially they, they did the TNC1, uh, then they did the TNC2, which became kind of the de facto uh, design for a TNC. And uh, they licensed that design to a number of companies. So the MFJ-1270 and the PACCOM uh, TNCs uh, and, and many others are actually the TNC-2 design that was licensed from Tapper. Uh, and then uh, as time went on, that the group really became international uh, in focus. Uh, and although we've been involved with Packet Radio, and for example, we were a, a very early uh, uh, supporter of the APRS uh, packet re- uh, position reporting system that Bob Reninga put together. Um, we uh, have moved on into other areas as well, and we really think of ourselves as uh, an R&D organization for amateur radio, and we're looking at what the technology will be that hams are using five years from now. And a couple of, of examples of, of how we did that uh, was uh, we uh, were supporting a, the design of a frequency hopping spread spectrum radio uh, back before Wi Fi uh, was popular. And uh, we, we engineered a complete radio that uh, could do, I think, 128 kilobits per second of data over a 30 or 40 mile path. And we supported the engineering. Uh, for that radio. Unfortunately, um, before we were able to go to production, all of the ICs that we used became obsolete, which taught us a lesson about uh, designing for production. Um, and then uh, so we, so we were very active in spread spectrum generally and supporting that and educating about it. 
then uh, software defined radio started to come along and uh, we were very early on the bandwagon with that uh, and actually uh, uh, a couple of the really big names uh, today in software defined radio f- made their first public showings at either the digital communications conference the tapper and the AWRL sponsor each year or at the Tapper booth at the Dayton Hamvention. Uh, so the very first Flex Radio uh, public demonstration uh, was, I, I think, at the DCC uh, of the, the, very, uh, the original STR-1000 three-board stack. And I actually had serial number two of, of that uh, radio when uh, Gerald was just getting Flex Radio going. And, and then another company that has become very prominent, not as much in ham radio, but in the uh, engineering and educational area, is Edis Research. And Edis uh, developed the uh, USRP, uh, Software Defined Radio. And Matt Edis uh, uh, first showed that off. I think that was at Hamvention. Uh, and, and Matt uh, is a ham. And actually, uh, when he was still in, I think, college, we had a, an academic competition, and, and Matt won the prize uh, for a paper that uh, uh, Tapper sponsored. So Matt uh, uh, has been with us, and uh, we've watched as Edis and Flex Radio both have grown. And you know, we were very proud that we were uh, part of the incubator that helped them get uh, get started. And uh, we continue to be active with, with software-defined radio, the uh, HPSDR that I referred to earlier, uh, was not a Tapper project as such. The, the people who designed it got together first, but they came to Tapper uh, for our help in doing production. And uh, we uh, uh, helped do a manufacturing run of uh, several hundred boards of, uh, I don't know, half a dozen or maybe more than that, uh, different uh, components of, of an HPSDR system. Uh, so we've, we've always been engaged in cutting edge and then the, uh, another area that we've been involved in recently, which is kind of all of my fault, is uh, my technical and engineering passion is precise time and frequency measurement. And I've developed a bunch of, of little projects, some of them very simple uh, uh, distribution amplifier that just takes a 5 or 10 megahertz reference signal in and gives you six buffered isolated outputs. Um, on up to the, the latest thing that I've uh, just finished, which is a uh, time interval counter uh, that's built on a shield on an Arduino, uh, and it can measure uh, time intervals down to 60 picoseconds, which is uh, 60 trillionths of a second. And uh, we uh, are, did a manufacturing run of that, and Tapper is selling those. Uh, so that's not purely ham radio related, but it's an area – that uh, the Tapper has really been able to make uh, uh, quite an impression uh, and stuff that uh, we've sold is used in radio astronomy observatories and universities and some of the national laboratories. So we've been able to make a a contribution into that engineering field as well. So I get the impression, based on a a paper that you presented to an industrial organization, that Tapper... Uh, is much larger in terms of its greater meaning to open development of hardware. Um, is am I getting the right sense of that? I think I think you're you're right. Um, and we you know, we don't define ourselves either by geography um, or by the packet radio that's in our title. We still support packet radio and uh, you know are are very happy to help if if there are projects that come along. Uh, but yeah, we're, we again think of ourselves as an R and D organization. We're ham focused, uh, but we're also interested in reaching a broader community. And uh, we've had some folks who've gotten their ham licenses uh, after being involved in uh, software radio work. For example, there's there's one person I'm thinking of who started out uh, as more of a hacker in the good sense, uh, doing uh, security testing and. Uh, and did work with software radios through that. And through his connection and involvement with Tapper, he decided to go ahead and get his license. So uh, we're hoping that what we do is relevant to the broader uh, technical community and that through uh, uh, involvement with us, uh, you know, some folks might get the bug and, and get their license. 
Let me take a quick break to tell you about my favorite amateur radio audio podcast, and that's the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KJ6VU, Jeremy, KF7IJZ, and it now includes Michael Walker, VA3MW, where they pursue topics, technology, and projects on their Ham Radio Workbenches every two weeks. The group documents their projects and makes circuit boards available to their listeners. They have interesting guests and go in deep. Jeremy may complain about the overall length of the podcast, but friends, let me tell you that I could listen to it all day, and that's good. Even if you are a seasoned ham radio builder or just getting started, be sure to join George, Jeremy, and Mike now for the Ham Radio Workbench podcast on every podcast player. Use the link on this week's show notes page by clicking on the image. And now back to our QSO today. Do you think that um, ham radio operators who are the the core um, hackers and hardware developers uh, can be the center of the uh, maker movement in terms of maker movement electronics? Absolutely. We should be. And and we're seeing some of that, but not nearly enough. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm correct about this. I should go back afterwards and look it up. But I think that um, the founder of uh, Adafruit, which is one of the big maker-focused uh, companies, uh, is a ham. Uh, yeah, I, I really should have checked that before yeah, our Lady conversation. Ada. Lady Ada, yeah. is a, she's a new ham. Yeah. But still and a ham. So, yeah. yeah, so thanks for that. And because we have to reach out to this you know, younger, broader community and show that ham radio is still relevant. And, I, and the maker community provides a perfect overlap and a, and a way for us to do that. So I'm, I'm very excited about our, our chances of working within that community and, and bringing new folks on board when they see the cool stuff that we can do. You have a presentation on Packet Radio on the Internet called Let's Not Forget Layer One. What was your involvement in Packet Radio, and what did you learn about it? Well, I, I got started in packet radio pretty early. I was living in Green Bay, Wisconsin at the time, and uh, we wanted to put up a bulletin board system. So uh, I got one of the old Xerox 820s that people were using uh, for PBBSs and was running that for my house. And then also, uh, because I was involved with uh, a bunch of folks in town who were both experimenters but also had connections in the two-way radio business, uh, we had access and could do pretty much whatever we wanted on one of the 1,000-foot uh, TV towers in town. So we had the right idea of putting up a digipeter at, I think, 900 feet above ground. And we learned that that doesn't work so well because it hears everything and hears so much that uh, uh, there's nothing but, uh, but collisions, uh, and uh, that's not really the best way to go. But that was the start. And uh, then when I moved to Ohio in 1988, uh, I, I got involved with a local group that had packet bulletin board. And there had been a higher speed packet backbone network that uh, had been built using 4800 baud. And uh, around that time, Cantronics came out with a data radio that could do up to 64 kilobaud. And uh, actually, I take that back. It might have been 19.2. But we, we built a, a network linking Dayton, Columbus, and Cincinnati, and, and actually for a while over toward Indianapolis, uh, using uh, these data radios uh, to get higher speed uh, transmission. And I also got involved with TCP IP over uh, packet radio at that time. Uh, and uh, just... Uh, uh, became fascinated, again, as much by the, the engineering as by actually using the thing. I probably didn't send an awful lot of PBBS messages, uh, and the fun for me was in getting the thing up and running and, and, and doing the design work. Uh, and that's sort of been a pattern uh, in uh, my activities. I don't uh, operate on the radio as much as I do think about building the stations and, and putting uh, systems together. Uh, and the, the, the layer one thing, just came out of learning about how to optimize packet radio. And, and layer one is the physical layer, the, the RF. And again, as hams, we should be thinking about that. And the point of that 
that paper and presentation, which I still get requests for after, I don't know, it's 15 years or something since I did that. Um, but it was about how important it is to properly set the audio level uh, to, uh, from the TNC to drive the radio and demonstrate a couple of ways ranging from literally nothing more than using your ears on up to using a service monitor to uh, uh, learn how to optimize the audio level and and that made a huge difference in the distance that you could work and the throughput that you could get. Is uh, packet radio still viable as a ham radio technology today? I think it is. Uh, it's, it's been a great disappointment that we have not succeeded in moving to higher speeds and that so much of, of packet radio is still 1,200 baud on two meters. Uh, and and Wi-Fi and and the HSMM type of activities have really taken the place of some of, of what we thought of packet being useful for. But you look at APRS, uh, which is a phenomenally versatile tool, you know, not just used for spotting where a car is, but weather reports and uh, all sorts of tactical information can be transmitted uh, uh, over APRS, and, and that still is very popular and uh, a very active uh, uh, development going on, new ways being thought of to use it. So the, the 1,200 baud, two-meter packet still has a place, um, but again, what we really need to do is figure out ways to uh, increase that speed so that we're competitive with the Internet and with wireless systems. And, and technically, there's no reason we can't do that. It's just that we, I, I don't think, have had the focus on it. And it's been one of the things that's been on my back burner, frankly, that I have wanted to focus on, but there have just been too many other uh, things uh, on the priority list. But, but I think that we could develop systems to, to use, say, our 3.3 gigahertz band uh, much more effectively and, and uh, get reasonable ranges and very high data speeds uh, out of systems running in that frequency range. We spoke a little bit in the pre-show about the Arduino. What do you think of that product? I, I have gotten really hooked on the Arduino. Uh, I've done three projects now that, that use it with custom shields. And uh, this most recent one, this, this time interval counter that I mentioned, you know, is really an incredibly sophisticated piece of gear. Uh, the only devices that are available commercially that have the, the equivalent performance are like in the five to ten thousand dollar or more class, and yet we can build this thing. We we sell it fully assembled with the Arduino for one hundred ninety nine bucks. Amazing. And and the capability, the what we're able to do with with this little eleven dollar processor board uh, is just astounding. It's uh, and I use it for I, I designed an RF switch uh, that. Basically, eight BNCs, and you can bank them in different ways, and that's controlled by the Arduino to uh, do basically automated switching because when I'm measuring clocks, I want to be able to, to look at four or five clocks maybe against the same GPS pulse per second uh, source. So I've got a, a Linux software that basically will go through – switch the relays to the right position, take the measurement, switch to the next position, take the measurement. And, yeah, it's all done on these little $10 processors with some other hardware that, uh, attached to it. And uh, just pretty fascinating stuff. One more break. Other than direct sponsorship of the podcast by becoming a listener sponsor, you can support the QSO Today podcast by clicking on the Amazon link on the show notes page before you go into Amazon. This will allow you to shop at Amazon's already low prices, and Amazon will pay us a commission at no additional cost to you on everything you buy. If you spend $100 on Amazon, QSO today gets 3 to $5. Your privacy is protected as we never know who is using the link or what is being purchased. We just get a check from Amazon a month or two later. Be a proactive listener not only by downloading the weekly podcast, but by also actively supporting my efforts by using my Amazon link. I need your help to keep the QSO Today podcasting coming to you every week. You can make a huge difference. Now, back to my QSO with John. You author John's Geek Blog, 
and have been posting your experiments. What experiments are you conducting now, and how will you apply them to amateur radio? Uh, well, m right now I'm not doing much of anything because my entire lab is packed up uh, in the basement, and I still need to need to get it hooked up. We've only been in the house here for about two weeks, but most of my experimentation has been in time and frequency measurement, and uh, one of the really interesting aspects of that has been uh, monitoring uh, the, the stability of uh, signals over HF propagation. And just as a very simple experiment, there are a number of ways you can do it, but just look at WWV um, over the course of a couple of days, and you can see that the frequency shifts by as much as a hertz uh, due to a uh, Doppler effect from the ionosphere changing. And it's really fascinating to see how that uh, shift happens. And then that relates to uh, a, a sub-aspect of both ham radio and my time and frequency interests, uh, which is the uh, AWRL-sponsored frequency measuring tests that they run a couple of times a year. And the idea is that hams listen uh, to a ham broadcast on an unknown frequency and measure it as accurately as they can and uh, send the results in. And again, the biggest challenge there, it's not having the stable transmitter or having the stable receiver it's what the ionosphere does along the way. And the people who do really well in, in the FMT, the frequency measuring test, are the ones who have a sense for what the atmosphere is doing to the signal. And sometimes you see just a smear of, of signal, you know, not just a single bright line on a spectrum display. And figuring out where the real signal is within that is, is an area that involves you know, understanding propagation and just uh, sort of having a sixth sense of uh, what's really happening uh, with the ionosphere. And I, I think that's really a, a fascinating activity. I haven't been much involved in it for the last couple of years, but um, I hope to get uh, more active uh, with that once I get the station set up here. Uh, you point out on your website that you're now a collector of HP test and measurement equipment. Um, who wouldn't want to be a collector of HP test and measurement <laughs> equipment? Um I ask this question every once in a while, you know, and uh, and I think we kind of alluded to this uh, in our pre-show discussion. But if your wife came to you and said, "John, all that stuff has to go, but you can keep one piece," what piece would you keep? There's actually a, a, a simple answer for that, um, and it's the first piece of expensive equipment that I bought, and I should stress. Most of what I have is stuff that I got from eBay or at flea markets for pennies on the dollar. So uh, uh, although uh, the list price in the HP catalogs of what's down in the basement is pretty gigantic, uh, I uh, didn't pay anything like that for it. But back uh, uh, in around 2000 or 2002, something like that, I got an a uh, HP 8920 service monitor. And I think, Eric, you said you have a CDMA set. Um, which is the same family as the 8920. And if I had to get rid of everything else, that is the one thing that I would keep because with it you can measure pretty much anything about an audio or an RF signal. Yeah, I think I have the 8924. Mm -hmm. I think the 24E, that, so it doesn't have the spectrum analyzer. Anybody out there has a spectrum analyzer module for it to make it a C, that would be really cool. But it weighs a ton. Uh, I think mm -hmm. your 8920 is actually smaller than my, my box. It, it, it is, yeah. yeah. It doesn't have a cellular test capability. And I think there was a, a box that you could get that sat on top of it that would give you cellular. But uh, the 8924 that you have has all that stuff built in, and it is a, a bigger box. I think you also have a, a fluorescent or plasma or something display well, the 8920 is uh, an old-fashioned CRT. I think mine's a CRT as well. What's interesting about that, for anybody wanting to know about these um, these devices, these service monitors, I love service monitors. I wish I could have a few more. This one has a big yellow sticker on it that says, Two Man Carry. <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. Okay, so I, I get it. I think a service monitor is probably the one thing I would keep as well. And I think the 8920 works from like 10 kilohertz to 3 gigahertz, something like that? Uh, it only goes to a gig. Only to a gig. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, that's a good choice of something to keep. It's a, a pretty well-rounded device. Although there is, is a second item, and not so much as test equipment, but for just general coolness, if I could only if I could keep one other much smaller piece of equipment, it would be uh, one of the wideband software-defined radios like the Hack RF or the USRP, because with one of those and a laptop, you can build a radio that that can do just about anything from daylight to six gigahertz, uh, depending on which piece you have. So. Uh, the only reason that wouldn't be the one thing I keep is that it's not as flexible for doing things like uh, uh, voltage measurement or or where you need precisely calibrated output. But to just have something to play with, uh, the software radio would, would clearly be the number one item. You mentioned in the pre-show that you're allowed to take anything down to the basement as long as your wife doesn't see it. I also said that I, my, my wife, the deal is, 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 is that I can take anything up to the attic uh, as long as she doesn't know about it either. The only thing we have to worry about is if we have to move and it all <laughs> and is discovered again. Yeah, and I, I just uh, did um, – I, I brought almost all of my ham and, and time and frequency and other lab gear uh, from Atlanta back to Dayton uh, in my car because I didn't trust the movers – to deal with that, and I think I made eight trips uh, with my station wagon fully loaded <laughs> to get everything <laughs> up there. So that's that's when you regret the uh, if she doesn't see it, it doesn't exist uh, model. Well, what's the most spectacular piece of equipment that you found at a ham fest? Oh, what a great question! I'm I'm trying to think, and spectacular can mean many things. Um, the most memorable one was the very first frequency standard that I ever bought, which was a 1960s vintage Sulzer quartz oscillator. Uh, that uh, that's really what got me hooked on on time and frequency measurement, and that that was a ham fest find in, uh, at uh, one of the shows uh, in the Chicago area. Um, I'm trying to think the other cool things. I probably I, I found a, a a very nice HP signal generator uh, that also has a two-man carry <laughs> uh, label on it uh, for almost nothing at a flea market, and brought it home, and it works perfectly. And that was that was maybe the most spectacular deal I've made. Yeah, something that makes your heart palpitate when you uh, you come across it. And I, I, I'm looking forward to the uh, Dayton Hamvention because I'm told that. Um, you could spend you know three days just walking through the flea market. Yeah, I I am looking forward to it, and of course, it's going to be very interesting for Hamvention this year because it's uh, at the new location, uh, and we, none of us knows quite what that's going to look like or how it's going to work out. Uh, but uh, it's certainly going to be a, a different place, and I think if nothing else, the change in the layout and structure. It's certainly going to force me to get out and look around with fresh eyes because I'm not going to know where everything is uh, automatically. So I'm going to have to wander uh, to reacquaint myself, and uh, that'll be a good chance to see more stuff. One of the things we talked about in the uh, pre-show interview is, is that we talked about the fact that um, you're an early blogger, maybe even before the term uh, blog was was put up. So I noticed at the bottom of your websites that um, it says created by VI. And um, most people don't know, but I kind of caught it right away that um, VI is a text editor. And so given the number of content management tools that are available today um, that people make you know, blogs out of, you're still using uh, the VI text editor, which I think is a real commitment to, uh, to programming. Are you a member of the cult of VI? Uh, I don't think... I'm really a cult member, particularly in, in, in the VI versus Emacs war. Uh, I use VI because it was simpler for me to learn, and, and it was there. And the website is is VI based, not out of any you know technological religious uh, war, but simply inertia. Uh, I got my uh, Fibo.com domain in 1994. Uh, and my website was started not long after that when I had an ISDN uh, connection 
uh, into my basement. Uh, and I have content there that's been there since about then. And it's just pure inertia that I haven't uh, ch- changed over to some other kind of more civilized uh, system. But for the amount of work that I do uh, um, on the web page, uh, using a text editor you know, has been uh, perfectly adequate. Uh, and and you, if you look at my pages, you'll also notice they're not fancy. Uh, so uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm able to use a simple tool because the, the web pages themselves are pretty simple. Part of being an early blogger, and you alluded to this at the beginning, you document everything. And one of the things that you documented was your encounter with keratoconus, which I might have said wrong, but it's a disease of the eye that affects the cornea. Did your in-depth research of the disease and documentation help you to find a solution or at least a way to live with the disease? It, it helped me tremendously in learning how to live with it. Uh, and it, yeah, I was diagnosed in college uh, with keratoconus, which is basically the cornea becomes conical rather than spherical, and it gets cracks and bumps and fissures, and uh, you end up with uh, vi- what is very much like a, a regular astigmatism. And uh, uh, today there are some new treatments that apparently are very successful, but they weren't available uh, at the time. So uh, in my case, the only option once the thing progressed far enough was to have a cornea transplants. And I, I had those in both eyes back in the uh, mid-1990s. Uh, and at the time, uh, there was very little information online about keratoconus. And uh, one or two people had done diaries of their surgical experience with the transplant. Uh, and there was a mailing list called KC Link. And I uh, became very active in that mailing list. It was tremendously helpful. And I ended up archiving the list and having a uh, members-only uh, searchable list on my website because their, their mailing list system didn't offer that. And when I had my surgery, I uh, also did a blog, except this, this was before blogs were invented. So we just called it uh, a diary, and I did one for uh, the first transplant and then a year later for the other one, uh, all done in, in VI. And uh, I still – this is now – act. Actually, 20 years later, um, I still get comments from people who run across my diaries uh, online and and find them very helpful as they're facing a similar situation. Uh, So I'm gratified for the assistance that the very limited online resources gave me, uh, but I'm also grateful that uh, what I've done has been helpful for other folks. Do you use uh, any social media? like uh, Facebook or anything like that as a way to keep in touch with communities like this? Um, not really. I'm, I'm on Facebook, and I've been getting more active uh, with it uh, uh, in the last uh, actually six months or so. Uh, but I'm I'm an old-fashioned guy in that I, I do most of my communication by email and, uh, and mailing lists. Um, and I uh, I guess I'm at a point where, with with my eye conditions, I don't really feel the the need for the external support. I've been living with this for the majority of my life, and come to terms with it, and know you know know how to make things work. So uh, I, I really haven't felt that need, but I I know that though the social media make it so much simpler uh, now than it was back uh, back when I was confronting things. What kind of impact has amateur radio had on your family life? Well, my wife got her ticket. Uh, She's not very active, but she's a a KC8, KDC, and she's extremely understanding and tolerant, and uh, she's abided by that. uh, You know, if it gets into the basement without her seeing it, it doesn't exist rule. Uh, Although when it has to come out of the basement, uh, there are looks of of shock at the amount of stuff that comes out. <laughs> but but now she's, she has been remarkably accommodating and, and, and puts up with a lot, and I, I have to be extremely grateful for that. Uh, I'll say. Um, I, my my uh, XYL is the same way, too. She's always surprised at what she finds if I have to reveal it. So the secret is to get it into the, either the basement or the attic when no one's looking. Mm-hmm. Do you have any offspring that um, have adopted the 
ham radio hobby? Uh, no, uh, my daughter uh, kind of ran as far away from it as possible. <laughs> <laughs> She's she she has the same kind of computer skills that uh, you know anyone growing up uh, today uh, would have, uh, but she has never had any interest in the technical side. And it's probably rebellion against her father or something. But uh, she uh, is un- unwilling to even look at a screwdriver. Well, I think um, our children tend to think we're kind of geeky. Yeah. I think that's okay. That's a badge of honor as far as I go. <laughs> what excites you the most about what's happening in ham radio now? I th- think the truly exciting thing is how easy it is for hams to innovate today. And it's it, it goes to the open hardware, which is part of it, the, the maker movement. But on both the hardware and the and the operating sides, uh, you know, we have every bit as much ability to to homebrew today as we ever did. Uh, you know, I can use a piece of free software to lay out a circuit board I can send that thing by email to a, a PC manu- PCB manufacturing company, and a week later I have the circuit boards back in hand. And they can have parts on them that are you know, so small that uh, uh, I could never uh, try to hand make a board to hold them. And uh, so, so we can still build hardware, and there's really no reason to be afraid of that. And, and you know, I do surface mount soldering all the time i do use a microscope but with my eyes and my coordination and i was voted uh in high school as the as the person most likely to stumble uh if i can do that stuff anybody can you just have to get over the the fear of the unknown Uh, so we can still build things but beyond that even if we don't want to fire up a soldering iron the software that we have available today is just astounding, and I, and I mentioned the the USRP uh, software defined radio. There's a, a software suite called GNU Radio that's a drag and drop system that you can actually build a complete radio on your laptop by by pulling blocks of filters and, and modulators and demodulators and things um, onto onto your screen and and using your mouse to connect them together. And then you plug the radio in via the USB or the Ethernet port, and you now have a, have a, a radio that works. And if you want to change something, you just go in and, and click on the mouse, and you can change it. So even if you don't want to solder, there is a huge opportunity for us to be innovative and, and work on new modulation methods uh, or uh, cool things like I, I, I used GNU Radio – and, and one of the USRP devices to build a, uh, a receiver that could pick up all seven of the NOAA weather radio transmissions simultaneously. And we could view them on screen or even listen to the audio of, of uh, all seven of them at once if you want. And that took me a couple of hours to put together, uh, all by drag and drop. I didn't write a single line of code. It was purely done in the graphic interface. So between the easy ability to make complicated hardware and the the ability that software radios provide us to do cool things purely uh, in software and with very high-level tools, you know, no one can say that, that hams aren't able to innovate anymore. I think it's easier uh, to innovate today than it's ever been at, at any time in the hobby. What advice would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? And this is sort of related to uh, the, the last question, but I think uh, explore what you can do. Uh, you know, not a, not everyone has to be a home brewer or an experimenter, but that's where I've always found the most pleasure and excitement uh, for me in not just radio but technology generally is is you know doing it yourself, and we just have more opportunities and abilities to do that today than we've ever had. And uh, I think hams, whether they're new or 
or uh, folks who are in the old old timers club uh, could benefit by by looking at all of the innovation that's happening and and the tools that make that innovation really practical and uh, and get in and roll your sleeves up and and just see what you can do it's it's a lot of fun well that's great advice and with that john i want to thank you so much for joining me on the qso today podcast I'm glad to be here eric this has been great fun yeah it has for me too 73 73 to you that concludes this episode of qso today I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with John. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put an N8UR in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 400. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services, including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric. 4Z1UG73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.